I declare that the 485th Convocation of McMaster University for the installation of the President and Vice Chancellor and for the conferring of degrees is now in session. Please uh, be seated. Very good morning to you all, President and Vice Chancellor elect, Chairman of the Board, special guests, Madam Provost, University Vice Presidents, Deans, our honorary graduate, members of the platform party, graduands, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to this 485th convocation of McMaster University. This is a particularly historic day, a day for all of us to celebrate. The installation of a new president and vice chancellor is a happy occasion for the entire McMaster family. And we welcome all those visiting for the ceremony. To those graduating, you've reached an important milestone, an exciting milestone in your lives. Many of you will begin careers embarking on new journeys. Some of you will be continuing your education, training, or preparation for more advanced or specialized activities. To the parents, grandparents, family members, spouses, and friends here today, you may bask in reflected glory and take pride in the accomplishments being recognized in this convocation. To our faculty and staff, today marks tangible recognition of your efforts, particularly the successes of your students evident in this ceremony. I wish you all an enjoyable morning. Mr. Chancellor, I have the honor to certify that the Senate of McMaster University on October the 14th, 2009, voted to nominate Patrick Dean to the Board of Governors as President and Vice Chancellor of the University, and that on October the 15th, 2009, the Board of Governors unanimously accepted the nomination. I now call on the chairman of the board to administer the oath of office. I now ask Dr. Dean to come forward. Sir. You are now formally to assume the functions in the office of the President and Vice Chancellor of this University, to which you have been duly appointed. You shall now swear to keep, preserve well and faithfully during your period of office the statutes, liberties, customs, rights, and privileges of the University, and to promote its well-being and that of its members so far as in you lies. I promise to do so. Please be seated.
By authority of the Senate and the Board of Governors, I now declare you, Patrick Dean, to be rightly installed as President and Vice Chancellor of McMaster University with all the rights and privileges of that office in token of which I give into your keeping this copy of the Charter of the University. I have the pleasure to call upon those representatives present this morning to extend greetings to Dr. Dean, the new president and vice chancellor of the university. On behalf of the Government of Canada, Mr. Dean Allison, Member of Parliament, Niagara West Glanbrook. Thank you very much for providing me with this opportunity to welcome on behalf of the Federal Government of Canada, Patrick Dean, as the new President and Vice Chancellor of Hamilton's own McMaster University. In a recent Globe and Mail interview, Dr. Dean was quoted as saying that he has a very powerful feeling about the importance of universities to their communities, not only as engines of prosperity, but as cultural and ethical resources to the community. I completely agree, and I believe that McMaster has chosen well in selecting a president with such an impressively stated core belief. Dr. Dean, as the Member of Parliament for Niagara West Glanbrook, on behalf of the Prime Minister Stephen Harper, I'd like to welcome you and your wife Sheila to the Hamilton area and to offer my sincerest congratulations upon your installation as President and Vice Chancellor. I wish both you and McMaster University much continued success. On behalf of the Canadian Sister Institutions, Mr. Paul Davidson, President, Association of Universities and Colleges of Canada. Mr. Chancellor, President Dean, members of the Convocation, it gives me great pleasure on behalf of the 95 universities and degree-granting colleges across Canada to welcome Patrick Dean as McMaster's new president. We look forward to working closely with this man of great intellect, vision, and passion for higher education. On behalf of the Ontario Sister Institutions, Dr. Ahmed Chakma, President, the University of Western Ontario. Good afternoon, Chancellor Wilson, distinguished guests, fellow presidents, students, faculty, and members of the community who are attending this fine celebration. I'm here today bringing greetings and heartfelt congratulations on behalf of Bonnie Pedersen, President of the Council of Ontario Universities, and all of the COU member institutions to Dr. Patrick Dean and the McMaster community. We are delighted that McMaster has chosen a thoughtful, measured, and wise man, one who already had contributed much to higher education in Ontario and beyond. Patrick is not a stranger to his colleagues at COU. Indeed, we are thankful that he was not going far when we heard that he was leaving his former posting at Queen's. Patrick has played an important role in numerous initiatives to improve the student experience at the institutions he has served, and he continues to provide his guidance and expertise on these issues in his new role at McMaster. He's a great leader for McMaster, and one who I know will build on the vision and leadership of his distinguished predecessor. So Patrick, on behalf of COU and your colleagues at COU Council, please accept our very best wishes 
we look forward to continuing to work with you to advance higher education in our great province. Enjoy this very special day. Before I finish, uh, Patrick, let me also take this opportunity to bring warmest greetings from your alma mater, your friends and colleagues at Western, uh, where you had served a distinguished career as a professor and in many other roles. I'm, however, sorry to say that uh, our Mustang football team has spoiled your installation here. <laughs> if this is of any consolation, you are not alone, because McMaster football team did the same thing during my installation here last year. On behalf of the city of Hamilton, Mr. Bob Bertina, mayor-elect. Chancellor Wilson, President Dean, members of the convocation. One of the most critical relationships in the growth of a city is the relationship between its university and the city governance. And I am delighted that we are beginning a journey at the end of which I think uh, both President Dean and myself and everyone involved with the university in the city of Hamilton will be pleased that our city has uh, finally realized the potential that we have talked about for so many years. The relationship between McMaster University and the city of Hamilton has always been uh, profound. We're at really the, the beginning of some, some very great projects and I am delighted to welcome President Dean to the city of Hamilton and also to uh, thank all of you, students, we're, we're desperate for you to, to thrive. And although many of you will be going to other places, we hope that you will always uh, keep Hamilton and McMaster in your hearts. And I know that President Dean and our city council will do everything we can to ensure that you will have a city and a university to speak of with great pride. Thank you and congratulations, President Dean. On behalf of the federal granting agencies, Dr. Suzanne Fortier, President, Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. Mr. Chancellor, Mr. President, distinguished guests and, and graduates, on behalf of the federal granting councils, I bring warm greetings and congratulations to Patrick Dean. And with those greetings, our wishes for a continuing stellar record of achievements in research and innovation in your university, McMaster University. We count on you to help us build Canada as a country of discoverers and innovators for the benefits of all Canadians. Congratulations, félicitations. On behalf of Mohawk College, Mr. Rob McIsaac, President, Mohawk College. Chancellor and Mr. President, distinguished guests, faculty, parents, family, friends, I am honored to bring you greetings on behalf of Mohawk College. Uh, and to you, the graduating class of 2010, in the words of that great philosopher, Dr. Seuss, congratulations, today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. The installation of Dr. Dean today marks uh, a new beginning for the partnership between Mohawk and McMaster. This is a relationship broadly regarded in the province of Ontario as a model for collaboration between colleges and universities. It is a relationship built on the strength of will of succeeding presidents of each of our institutions uh, and nurtured by caring and progressive faculty members. The principal beneficiary of this collaboration has been our students who graduate with the skills, the analytical frameworks and the values needed to fully participate in our society. I believe that based on the meetings I have had with 
Patrick, to date in the fast friendship we have struck, there is so much more we will accomplish in the years to come. Patrick, on behalf of Mohawk College, welcome and congratulations. We are absolutely delighted you are here. Thank you. On behalf of the McMaster Faculty Association, Dr. John Berlinski. Mr. Chancellor, honored guests, colleagues, graduands, families, and friends of McMaster. I'm here today representing the faculty of McMaster University to welcome our new president, Patrick Dean. McMaster's faculty like faculty everywhere, are a diverse group representing many disciplines and many points of view, more often than not conflicting. And so it is significant that this group stands united in welcoming Patrick Dean, a humanist and a scholar, a seasoned administrator, and a committed colleague as their new president. So we welcome you today, Patrick, at the start of this new journey. It's great to have you on board. On behalf of McMaster University students, Ms. Mary Kozial, President McMaster Student Union, Elaine Marion, President McMaster Association of Part-Time Students, and Jessica Maroli, President Graduate Students Association. It's an absolute privilege to address Dr. Dean on behalf of students on this very special occasion. One of the things that makes me most proud as a McMaster student is McMaster's ongoing dedication to being a student-centered, research-intensive university. In his short tenure here, Dr. Dean has already demonstrated a rem remarkable commitment to these values. On behalf of the Graduate Students Association, the McMaster Association of Part-Time Students, and the McMaster Students' Union. Dr. Dean, we'd like to thank you for your remarkable, your remarkable commitment and genuine interest in students. We're absolutely delighted to have you as our president, and we welcome you. And on behalf of the CAW Local 555, Mr. Matt Root, President. Chancellor Wilson, President Dean, graduates and distinguished guests, I have been asked to bring greetings this morning from the non-teaching support staff. Universities where achievements are made by groups of people rather than individuals alone, and our members are proud to be a part of the McMaster team and are committed to working together to achieve excellence. Dr. Dean, on behalf of the 2,200 members of CAW Local 555, we wish to heartily welcome you to McMaster and look very much forward to working with you to continue to build an atmosphere of success and well-being for all members of the McMaster community. It is now my pleasure to introduce the members of the installation party. Representing the University of Prince Edward Island, Dr. Luke Chan. (Applause) 
representing McGill University, Dr. Andrea Alexander. <laughs> representing the University of Toronto, Dr. Patricia Howard. <laughs> representing Acadia University, Dr. Bruce Frank. Representing Mount Allison University, Dr. Michael Fox. <laughs> Representing Queen's University, Dr. Daniel Wolf. <laughs> Representing the University of Manitoba, Dr. Frank Wong. Representing the University of Western Ontario, Dr. Amit Chakma. <laughs> Representing King's University College, Dr. David Sylvester. <laughs> Representing the University of British Columbia, Dr. Ala Abdel Aziz. Representing Wilfrid Laurier University, Dr. Paul Jessup. <laughs> Representing Memorial University of Newfoundland, Dr. Valerie Taylor. <laughs> Representing Carleton University, Dr. Graham Knight. Representing Ryerson University, Dr. Raymond Craniac. <laughs> Representing the University of Waterloo, Dr. Susan Elliott. <laughs> Representing York University, Dr. Rhonda Lenton. Representing Laurentian University, Dr. Robert Kerr. <laughs> Representing Brock University, Dr. Christopher Capradoni. <laughs> Representing the University of Guelph, Dr. Alistair Summer Summerley. Representing Simon Fraser University, Dr. Gregory Pond. <laughs> Representing Vancouver Island University, Dr. Janet Cavanaugh. <laughs> Representing Concordia University, Dr. Peter Vita. Representing Redeemer University College, Dr. Hubert Kreigsman. <laughs> Representing Nipissing University, Dr. Craig Cooper. <laughs> Representing McMaster Chancellor Emeritus, Dr. Mel Hawkrig. <laughs> Representing McMaster President's Emeriti, Dr. Alvin Lee. <laughs> Dr. 
and representing Dalhousie University, Dr. Ian McLean. I would now like to invite our honorary degree recipient, Ms. Adrian Pazanka, to come forward for a musical tribute in honor of the President's installation. Good morning. Uh, this morning I'd like to sing to you a song called An die Musik, which means Ode to music, and it's translated thus. O oh, sweet art, in how many gray hours, when life's wild orbit ensnared me, have you kindled my heart to warm love and carried me away to a better world? Often a sigh escaping from your harp has opened up for me the heaven of better times. O oh, lovely art, for this I thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Pazanka. Das war ausgezeichnet. I'd like now to invite President Dean, President and Vice Chancellor Dean, to uh, deliver the convocation address. President Dean. Mr. Chancellor, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, graduating students, it is a great pleasure to be here today and to accept this honor. 
And I thought in these comments to the graduating class, I would reflect on certain important aspects of my own undergraduate career and the impact of that career on my life as it has evolved. In 1975, I was an undergraduate at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. These were difficult years in South Africa. Persecution and humiliation were the daily lot of the majority of citizens, not least because of a determination on the part of the state actively to contest their right to citizenship itself. To a young man, a young white man from the English-speaking minority, such as myself, the campus environment, at that time a hotbed for anti-apartheid activism, was exciting, but also confusing. And confusion arose because the university, being government-funded and owing its existence to parliamentary statute, was in important ways inseparable from, and one sometimes thought complicit in, the established order against which many in the student body felt compelled to protest. Predictable intergenerational hostility was complicated by the sympathetic presence at many of our protest, meet, protest meetings of the university vice chancellor, often in full academic dress, such as this, and surrounded by eminent colleagues from the professoriate clad in their doctoral scarlet. Although we knew that they wore their academic regalia in an attempt to prevent the police breaking up our meetings as a riotous assembly, the spectacle was confusing. Here was the leader of the institution, dressed in a manner that asserted his leadership and appeared to confirm his allegiance with the status quo, joining with students in protest against policies propagated by what we thought to be the very source of his own authority, the government. I have many vivid memories from this time, including one of Dr. Philip Tobias, the eminent paleoanthropologist, professor of anatomy, and world-renowned authority on human evolution, deftly slipping away through a cloud of tear gas, his billowing robe asserting in very stark contrast to the uniforms of rampaging riot police, the elusive yet indomitable value of humane learning and scientific inquiry. Another memory from the same year is of the annual academic freedom lecture given by Ronald Dworkin, soon to become famous as a philosopher of law and a constitutional scholar teaching at Yale, New York University, and the University of London. In 1969, at the age of 38, Dworkin had been appointed to the chair of jurisprudence at Oxford. And when I heard him speak in Johannesburg, he was a passionate man in his mid-40s. This was a transformational experience for me, although I do not think I realized it at the time. Dworkin established his reputation as a critic of legal positivism, a doctrine derived from the work of Jeremy Bentham that asserts there is no inherent or necessary connection between the validity of law on the one hand and ethics or morality on the other. In 1977, he was to publish a book called Taking Rights Seriously, which expanded upon the notion of what he called law as integrity, which, as an undergraduate listener, I took to mean that there is a necessary epistemic connection between law and ethics or morality. This way of thinking blew away the clouds of confusion for me. The notion that an unethical or immoral law must be opposed and could be opposed without necessarily vitiating one's allegiance to one's country, made it possible 
for the Vice Chancellor to engage in protest against the enforcement of apartheid in the Academy without necessarily abnegating his authority, without being required, figuratively as well as literally, to cast off his gown of office. The fundamental question was this, in whose name did he wear that gown? At one level, this was easy to answer, for as the presence of the ceremonial mace at convocation made clear, the right of the university to grant degrees came from the state. From what source, however, did he derive his authority to critique the state itself? And did all of us, students, faculty, and staff alike, derive our right to demur at injustice? If that authority depended upon the government of the day, it was obvious that he and we had no serious right to protest, and our activities were illegitimate. But they did not feel illegitimate, and Dworkin's insistence on law as integrity showed us why. The authority upon which the university was built derived not from the monolithic state as temporarily constituted by partisan politicians, but from society as the constantly shifting sum of human experiences, aspirations, and contradictions. The triumph of reason and justice, which was the release of Nelson Mandela and the advent of democracy in South Africa, is known to you all. But had we not, had the country not, during those dark years, maintained its allegiance to law as integrity, the outcome most certainly would have been disastrous. Law had to be understood as enjoying an epistemic, even if in practice inconsistently realized, relation to ethics. Furthermore, and this is simply an extension of that last point, the authority asserted by the Vice Chancellor in my anecdote was nothing if not derived from values that transcended the state itself. Law as integrity was a theory, a theory that made not society itself, but social idealism, the valorization of a just society, the foundation, justification, and raison d'etre for the law. That, at least, was what I understood in the 1970s to be the import and application in South Africa at that time of Ronald Dworkin's thinking. The notion has remained with me ever since, surviving my decisions to leave the study of law, subsequently to become a scholar and teacher of English literature, and eventually to commit myself to the service of higher education in the kind of administrative role into which I have been inducted today. The story of the Vice Chancellor's presence at protest meetings is worth telling because it helps make sense of those decisions which cumulatively have brought me here to McMaster. The issue of the Vice Chancellor and his authority, his responsibility to social and human values beyond the immediate and contingent, bears directly upon this ceremony and the significance of the gown that has just been placed on my shoulders. The gown is a gift of the McMaster University Alumni Association, and I'm very proud and grateful to receive it. I'm even more proud when I reflect on what the gift means, that our graduates now at work in the world maintain their investment in their university, that they have an interest in its leadership, and that they understand the extent to which the work of the university must be integrated with or at least responsive to their hopes and the constructive aspirations of our society at large. I use that word integrated to trigger in your minds a recollection of Dworkin and the idea of law as integrity. For insofar as the academic vestments of my vice chancellor in Johannesburg in some way symbolized the dependence of law on ethics and morality, 
on positive civil aspirations, I invite you to think of this garment as a symbol of education as integrity, by which I mean quite simply the obligation we in the university must acknowledge to work constantly towards the betterment of our immediate community and broader society. In this province and in this country, those goals are frequently shared with government, but this is not always or necessarily the case, as the South African example attests. And for that reason, it is critical to be clear at all times about the source of university authority and about the different forms of that authority. I'm speaking this morning in commitment to the idea of service as an underlying value of the academy. Today at United Nations headquarters in New York City, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon is being joined by representatives from academic institutions in more than 35 countries, formally to launch UNAI, or United Nations Academic Impact, an initiative intended to promote the direct engagement of institutions of higher education in programs and projects relevant to the United Nations mandate, and in particular, to the realization of that organization's Millennium Development Goals, the eradication of extreme poverty and hunger, achievement of universal primary education, the promotion of gender equality and the empowerment of women, the reduction of child mortality, improvement of maternal health, progress in, progress in combating HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases, and the achievement of environmental sustainability. McMaster University joined UN Academic Impact soon after its establishment and is one of a relatively small number of Canadian institutions to be signatories. So it is appropriate that today, while sister institutions around the world are gathered in New York City to reaffirm their determination to improve the human condition through higher education, that we should pause to reflect on the way in which McMaster University contributes to that effort. Education as integrity. A somewhat mundane, though nevertheless profound, interpretation of the phrase is that the practice of learning and teaching is nothing less than the embodiment of honesty and sound ethics. My faculty colleagues on the platform and in the audience would no doubt expatiate at length on the idea of an ethical pedagogy. And it is obvious that a powerful connection exists between the dominion of honesty and ethics in the classroom and the rule of those same values in society. Because the university derives its authority from higher human values and a committed civility, it furthermore goes without saying that the day-to-day -day activities of the institution need to reflect that commitment. Hence, collegiality and the principle of academic self-governance must be respected and reinforced, as must fairness, openness, and transparency, as well as the fundamental principle of academic freedom, which not only allows, but encourages dissent and disagreement. It remains astonishing to me, and an odd sort of consolation, that the apartheid regime in those difficult days in South Africa could never quite bring itself entirely to eliminate academic freedom. Even though you had to do so under supervision of a stern and disapproving librarian, you could read Marx's Kapital or the Communist Manifesto, and the vice chancellor could put on his robe of office and tell the student body why detention without trial was indefensible in a civilized society and why the doctrine of habeas corpus had to be defended. Barbarism, evidently, is only rarely absolute. There are also less obvious resonances for the phrase education as integrity. The language suggests wholeness, education as a gathering in or reconciliation of diverse elements. And we are reminded that this is an activity of the highest order, that it should be available to all, 
and should act for the betterment of all, and that education is diminished in value and effect when it falls out of touch with the full gestalt of human concerns. What is going on in New York at this moment is an attempt to take such an understanding of education beyond sanctimonious generalization, to make the work of the university more meaningful and the learning process more successful through a dynamic and interactive engagement with the very human problems which it seeks to address. Over the last decade, universities, especially in the English-speaking world, have participated in an increasingly bloodless marketing discourse focused on global citizenship as the goal to which they and their students should aspire. But for all this time, they've failed effectively to define this, to renegotiate the relationship upon which such aspirations might successfully be built, the link between institutions of higher education and the world, the everyday world, which purportedly they seek to serve. To require that students acquire an international experience at some point in their degree is admirable, but it is also minimal in what it is likely to contribute either to the student's development or to the nation visited. What kind of education is it that relegates experience of the broader world to an optional add-on available only in the senior years? Or worse, assumes that experience of the world is unworthy of academic credit and must be postponed until after graduation? What kind of education assumes that the world begins, or at least demands to be reckoned with, only once you leave your national borders? And what kind of education leads students to believe that the world exists to provide an arena and a resource for their personal improvement? In New York today, the emphasis is on impact. What appears to be yet another conference on academic internationalization is in fact a significant departure from the discourse so far. The sponsorship of the United Nations at this event is in fact misleading. Although many nations are represented, nationhood itself is not directly relevant. The intention is to rally the universities of the world to focus on their obligation to address humanity and its most urgent needs. In certain cases, this obligation and the discharge of it will be transnational, while in other cases, it will not. McMaster University, as a signatory to academic impact, could certainly boast about our contributions to nursing in Pakistan, or to the treatment of diabetes and related disorders in the Indian and Indo-Canadian population. But we could just as easily focus on the work of our researchers in addressing aging or poverty in the city of Hamilton. I have recently said that at McMaster we need to define and refine our understanding of our place in the international context. I do believe, though, that we must understand our international commitments as merely a subset of our encompassing human obligation. And it is in attending to the latter that we will find a firm and clear direction to follow. That obligation is not confined to the Millennium Goals of the United Nations, although they do provide a helpful hook on which to hang a more defensible vision for higher education. Universities are comprehensive multifaceted organizations, and it is just as important to recognize the complexity of the interface between the university and society as it is the simple requirement that we derive at least one part of our authority from society and from the human dream of health, prosperity, civility, and cultural fulfillment. The community in which McMaster is situated is no less complex and rich than the university itself. The city of Hamilton and the university have grown up together, and there is no doubt that we have contributed to each other's success. When I think about McMaster's academic impact as per the UN initiative, 
I do think of Pakistan, India, and the many places in the world where our teaching and research has brought benefit. But I come back to Hamilton as the place where the university's engagement with the world has to begin, always. Just as integrity, education as integrity, presupposes collegiality, honesty, and fairness within our university community, so also it commits us as an institution to work for the enrichment and development of a healthy, just, and prosperous community around us. This is unproblematic, if not easy. So long as we understand that education, if it is to have and to serve integrity, must be at least a two-way process. Notwithstanding the nomenclature, the best teacher is the individual most open to learning, and any learner fully seized of her subject will inevitably teach. The object of study is that from which we learn, which observation opens a way to imagining the benefits that will accrue equally to our students and to the community when we explore the potential of service or experiential learning in the social sciences, in medicine, engineering, humanities, business, or science. To assert that global citizenship cannot be learned in a local context is simply wrong. Poverty on our doorstep is like poverty 4,000 miles away. While the cultural and socioeconomic determinants may differ, the nature of the human experience is similar, and it is possible to extrapolate from analysis of the local to shed light on problematic areas of the global. This is the gathering in and interconnecting function of education as integrity. In closing, and to illustrate that last point, I have one further anecdote involving my alma mater, the University of the Witwatersrand. This comes from a later, a slightly later phase than that with which I opened, the mid to late 90s after the arrival of democracy in South Africa and at the beginning of what turned out to be a major transformation in the system, the system of higher education in that country. The Vice Chancellor of the time, by then a different person from he with the penchant for wearing academic regalia while simultaneously breathing tear gas, was faced with a dilemma not unrelated to that confronted by his predecessor. After 50 years in which the majority of the population had been denied a decent school education, should the university protect its distinguished international reputation by insisting on entrance requirements so demanding that effectively the majority would continue to be excluded? Or should the institution's global standing be sacrificed, perhaps temporarily, in order to address the immediate needs of a hitherto disenfranchised population. This was a real and for many a painful predicament, particularly since it pitted progressive social views against academic aspiration, sometimes within the same individual. But ultimately, the university acted as if Ronald Dworkin's argument from 1975 was still being heard. Integrity in education meant that international standing bought by betraying local interest was unacceptable. Advancement of the university that directly or indirectly hobbled the community in its quest for prosperity, civility, and justice was reprehensible. So, for a decade, the university concentrated its efforts on undoing, through education, the legacy of apartheid after which it emerged once again onto the international community of learning. Today in Ontario, we face pressure to internationalize, and yet, as I've said earlier, it is unclear what should be the proper relationship between that global thrust and our local obligations. The universities daily face the challenge of accommodating the many students who wish to attend and are qualified to attend, and in all of this, the talk of accountability and of obligation looms large. 
To understand properly the question of the university's statutory commitment and authority and the relation between that and our moral or ethical obligations will be fundamental to our prospects for success. Although we do not find ourselves in immediate danger from tear gas and other cruder forms of interference and intimidation, the drift of the university sector is nevertheless not entirely within our control. For that reason, education as integrity remains worthy of our vigorous advocacy and defense. And how urgently you would only understand if you had ever seen it under threat. For today's graduating students, with whom I am very proud to share in this celebration, and whose patience in enduring this address I greatly admire. <laughs> My hope is that your time at McMaster has given you a great many experiences as inspiring to you and as influential upon you as those I have recalled today from my own student days. If you're anything like me, the real significance of many of those experiences will disclose itself to you only over time. I leave you, though, with the reminder that just as those who would teach must be open to learning, and those who have learned, like yourselves, have an obligation to teach or foster enlightenment in whatever form of work they find themselves and in whatever circumstances. Without you, the Academy will have little impact. I wish you well, and I commend to you a life of reflection, sound action, and integrity. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. President, for a very thoughtful, inspirational talk. Education is integrity, collegiality, honesty, fairness, openness, academic freedom were words that I wrote. The university in the world, the word engagement came to my mind. It's clear, ladies and gentlemen, that we have a president who, through both experience and a lifetime of thought, cares very deeply about the university, this university, and that augurs well for all of us. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. Chancellor, by the authority of the Senate of McMaster University, I have the honor to present Adrian Elise Pitzonka. One of the world's leading operatic sopranos, Adrian Pitzonka studied at the University of Western Ontario and the University of Toronto, but she has long been a member of the McMaster family. Her father, Waldemar Wally Pitzonka, is a two-time McMaster graduate who received an honorary degree from his alma mater in 1998. Today, 
Ms. Pizonka joins her father in that distinction, and they become one of a very small number of father-daughter honorary degree recipients in our university's 123-year history. Ms. Pizonka began her career at the Canadian Opera Company in Lady Macbeth of Mzensk in 1988. She would later return to the company for guest appearances such as 1994's production of La Boheme, in which she portrayed Mimi. In 1989, she moved to Europe, where she lived for nearly 20 years. She initially joined the Vienna Volksoper, becoming a member of the Vienna Staatsoper in 1991. Her critical and popular successes have been numerous, including her 1990 feud, uh, 1995 debut in the United Kingdom at the Festival Opera. There, her performance as Donna Elvira in Don Giovanni brought an immediate invitation to return to sing the role of Arabella the following year. In 1997, she traveled to Buenos Aires to bring Tatiana to the stage in Eugene Onegin at the Teatro Colón. These are just a few of more than 30 roles in a repertoire that includes the work of Mozart, Verdi, Wagner, Janacek, Tchaikovsky, Beethoven, and Strauss. Ms. Pizonka has established herself on the great operatic stages of Europe, including the Royal Opera House, Covent Garden, La Scala, Munich, Berlin, and Paris, as well as respected festivals such as Salzburg, Bayreuth, and Lucerne. She has performed under the direction of the world's greatest conductors, including Sir George Schulte, Sir Colin Davis, Zubin Mehta, Valery Gergiev, Kent Nagano, Nicholas Hanoncourt, Lauren Mazel, and Richard Bradshaw. Ms. Pizonka has contributed to a number of live and studio recordings with her recent release of Puccini arias on the Orfeo label receiving the 2010 Juno Award for Best Classical Vocal Recording. That followed on the critical and popular success of a disc featuring her greatest Wagner and Strauss roles. Starring as Elsa in a 2009 recording of Lohengrin, Ms. Pizonka and her collaborators were recognized with the Disc of the Year Award and the Opera Award at the 2010 BBC Music Magazine Awards. She also contributed to the Juno Award-winning Beethoven, Ideals of the French Revolution, with her recording of The General, Paul Griffith's tribute to Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire. Ms. Pizonka has also won critical acclaim for Falstaff with Bryn Terfel, Don Giovanni with Claudio Abado, the complete orchestra songs of uh, Richard Strauss and Die Fledermaus. An officer of the Order of Canada, Ms. Piazonka was awarded the title Kammersängerin by the Austrian government in 2007 for her distinguished contributions to vocal music in that country. In 2005, Ms. Piazonka moved back to Canada, and she now appears regularly with the Canadian Opera Company, as well as other North American companies, such as the Metropolitan Opera, the San Francisco Opera, and the Los Angeles Opera. Adrian Pizonka is a Canadian whose talent and career have played out on a truly international level. The New York Times has celebrated her lushly beautiful sound and poignant vulnerability. La Scena Musicale recognized her singing for its combination of beauty, power, and nuance. Today, Mr. Chancellor, we pay tribute to Ms. Piazonka's more than two decades of operatic excellence. I ask that you confer upon her the degree Doctor of Letters Honoris Causa. Adrian Pazanka, by the authority of McMaster University Senate, I have the great pleasure to confer upon you the degree Doctor of Letters Honoris Causa in McMaster University with all the rights and privileges pertaining to that degree. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Please sign away.
I would now call upon Dr. Pazanka to address convocation. Dr. Pazanka. Thank you. Mr. Chancellor, Mr. President, distinguished guests, family and friends, and most of all, graduates. Let me begin by extending my congratulations to the new president, Mr. Patrick Dean. It is a great privilege for me to be here with you this morning to receive this honorary doctorate of letters and to take part in this extra special convocation ceremony. Although I spent most of my adult life performing and living in Europe, I'm actually a local girl. I grew up in Burlington, about 20 kilometers from McMaster, and I have a strong family tie to this university, as the president pointed out. Both of my parents attended McMaster, and I remember leafing through their old yearbooks and marveling at the fashions of the 1950s. My mother earned a Bachelor of Arts majoring in English in 54, my father a master's degree of physics in 57, a PhD in physics in 1960, and the honorary doctorate in 1998. My mother was born in Hamilton and grew up in Westdale, and during my childhood we would often drive in on a Sunday afternoon to have dinner with my grandparents who also lived in Westdale. Growing up, we attended regular performances of the Hamilton Philharmonic on this very stage. As a teenager, I began studying voice and music theory at the Hamilton Conservatory of Music. So, although I didn't attend McMaster myself, I do feel connected to your academic community through my family history. In awarding me, an opera singer, an honorary doctorate, McMaster is thereby honoring and celebrating music and the performing arts. I believe it is vital that we continue to nourish and support the arts in all disciplines. And I was delighted to learn that McMaster may soon have a new liberal arts building on campus. Uh, getting back to uh, the first song I sang, which was all about sort of thanking music. Um, and the last line was, oh lovely art, for this I thank you. I'm full of thanks today as well thankful to music itself, which has been such an inspiration and joy to me throughout my life, to McMaster University for bestowing upon me this honorary doctorate, to my family, many of whom are here today to celebrate with me, and to my wonderful wife and daughter for their love and support. I'm going to sing now an aria from Puccini's Gianni Schicchi, and I think you'll all know it, O mio babbino caro.
Wow, what a voice, what an instrument. Welcome back to Hamilton, Ms. Pazanka. Thank you very much for your performance and for your kind words, and congratulations once again.